tonight we're streaming from beautiful Centennial, Colorado. Uh, thank you to everyone who's attending in person. Thank you to everyone who's here online. We're here tonight to talk about MS with Dr. John Corboy. I'm Kelsey Morrow, Education Manager for the Rocky Mountain MS Center. I would also like to thank the pharmaceutical companies who have provided patient education grants to support this series. Thank you to Bristol-Myers Squibb, Genentech, and Janssen Pharmaceuticals. This speaker series is just one piece of our educational programming. We have a variety of formats available, including both in-person and online options, and most of our programs are also archived on our YouTube channel. The latest videos that we've posted were our Fall Education Summit, which took place earlier this month and covered topics like the differences and similarities between NMO and MS, research updates, addressing mobility concerns, the concept of PIRA, and cognition. We have several webinars coming up, including demystifying MRIs, preparing for disability, and cognitive function in MS. We announce all of our educational opportunities through our mailing list, uh, our Facebook page, and you can also sign up on Eventbrite to get notifications from them. All of our education programs are free of charge uh, to anyone interested, but if you are interested in uh, donating to monetarily support the MS Center, I do encourage you to check out Colorado Gives Day, which is coming up on December 5th, um, or anytime at mscenter.org. And now I'll introduce you to Dr. John Corboy. Dr. Corboy is a graduate of the University of Pennsylvania and did his neurology residency there with a fellowship at Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore. He specialized in MS and neurovirology at the University of Minnesota Medical Center before coming to Colorado in 1994. In 1997, he founded the University of Colorado MS Center, now transformed into the Rocky Mountain MS Center at University of Colorado, a multidisciplinary group offering state-of-the-art care and research to multiple sclerosis patients. Dr. Corboy is the director of that program, as well as our medical director at the Rocky Mountain MS Center. We did have a lot of great questions submitted at registration, and we'll get to them as, as many of them as we can tonight. Again, you can ask new questions by typing them into the chat box or raising your hand here in person. Um, and then just a reminder that today's presentation is for informational purposes only. All decisions regarding MS treatment and medications should be discussed with your neurologist. With that, I'll turn it over to you. Great. Thanks, Thanks very much, much everybody, for coming. Uh, appreciate it, Kelsey. And um, I would just reiterate um, some of the questions that we receive are about very personal things about one individual's care. And it's, it's clearly not a form for second opinions in that regard. Broad questions are really where we're going to be uh, better off, I think, tonight, uh, because I will have not have met most of you. I know some of you, uh, but I will, I will have not have met most of you and uh, don't know really you care. And I wouldn't share your care with anybody else anyway. Um, so the format is that usually I just talk for five or ten minutes about a couple of recent things that might be of interest, and then we just go to questions. So I have a whole bunch of questions that were pre-sent in, but you may have some other questions. And if you do, uh, how are we going to do that, Kelsey? Then they'll just give them to you, and then... All right, perfect. Okay, great. Um, so um, a couple of things that are of potential interest. Um, uh, one is uh, many of you may know that there are on many ongoing studies with a bunch of different classes of new medications or hopefully to be new medications, including one class uh, called BTK inhibitors. BTK inhibitors are, uh, they're actually... Um, enzyme inhibitors that have, as opposed to the concept of the monoclonal antibodies, which would attach to uh, a particular molecule on the outside of a white blood cell, and then either block its function or destroy the cell, these would actually interact on the outside of the cell, but just change some of the mechanics inside the cell. So the cell is still well alive, but it's not nearly as inflammatory uh, as it might otherwise have been. And the uh, potential utility of these BTK inhibitors is that the, this particular uh, class of enzyme inhibitors uh, specifically interacts with B lymphocytes, which we know are very important in the pathogenesis of MS because, in fact, we have multiple drugs that have impacts on the B cells. Uh, in addition, however, they have a, an important effect, at least what we can see in animal models and then also in, in uh, like cell culture uh, studies, uh, that there's a significant impact on what are known as microglia. And microglia are immune-based cells. They're part of the immune system. 
but they don't travel all throughout your body like many immune-based cells do. They are limited to the brain and the spine. They're similar cells like in the liver that are called Kupfer cells. And they too are involved in the pathogenesis of MS, but in a different way than the B cells are and the T cells, the ones that we usually talk about. And they're uh, the microglia are part of what's known as the innate immune system. And they are very important from the very beginning of time when people have issues related to MS uh, all the way through uh, the rest of their life. And for some people, it's a relatively modest amount, but for many people, they're very much important for progressive MS. So the hope is that these molecules, of which there are three in phase three studies right now, meaning the studies that are done, that the FDA will then look at and say, yes, this is okay, you should be approved, or no, you should not. There are multiple phase three studies with the three, tri with the three drugs, about seven or eight different trials for both relapsing as well as progressive forms of MS. And uh, the first readout for one of these will be, uh, I think it's with Eva Brutnib was, uh, is uh, the name of this one, will read out, I believe, in about one to two months. So there'll be a series over the next couple of years of another six, seven uh, other studies in, in both uh, types of MS. Uh, so that's important in and of itself. The only speed bump that has occurred so far is that these molecules are, are they're very small. There's chemicals. Uh, they're not monoclonal antibodies, these large proteins that we oftentimes use now. And they're taken orally, well-tolerated in general, and passed through the blood-brain barrier to actually intersect with these cells inside the brain. Uh, the only thing that's happened so far that's been a little bit of a concern is that there have been a very small number of individuals who have, who've had some liver function abnormalities with these, and they've been significant enough, even if there's only a very, very small number, that the FDA has asked uh, for stopping of recruitment of several of the studies uh, that are not the ones that I just mentioned, um, and, uh, and they put them on hold. Uh, and it's, we're talking about maybe in one study where this happened last week with a drug called fenibrutinib. Uh, it was two patients who had uh, elevated liver enzymes. They stopped the drug, their liver enzymes went back to normal. I'm not, uh, uh, I'm not privy to all the details of all that. A lot of that is uh, in front of just the FDA, but uh, only to say that that's something that's gonna have to be worked out. Uh, but the hope is that that will not be a, uh, inhibitor to getting these uh, medications fully studied and hopefully approved, and we'll see. Another thing that you may be aware of is that there are maybe multiple different ways you could attack event, uh, MS. And one, of course, would be to do what we're doing now, which is to try and use the medications that are part of uh, treating what we call the adaptive immune system. What I just mentioned with the BTK inhibitors and microglia would be attacking the innate immune system. They're sort of yin and yang of the immune system. You might also uh, want to try and come up with uh, processes that would help protect cells that are partially damaged from dying. Because we know that a lot of cells uh, can recover after say an acute attack of MS, but they will be damaged and they won't necessarily be able to do all the things that they want or need to do over time. And eventually they may fail and die in part uh, oftentimes from uh, essentially power failure in the cell. They can't continue to make enough energy in the cell. So there's a, a lot of push to try and do neuroprotective approaches. There's been some early work with remyelination, connecting one nerve to another, the long cable with the myelin wrapping that's around it that is considered part of the target for MS. And our partner, Dr. Bennett, has shown that uh, in a paper published in August that the so-called proteolipid protein, a protein that's studded into the myelin, may well be the target for the abnormalities that we find in the spinal fluid. This has been something that people have been trying to find out for only 70 years. And now um, they believe that they have identified, uh, he and his partners have identified up to 60% of the so-called oligoclonal bands in the, uh, in the spinal fluid are directed against this proteolipid protein. And they have uh, a good jump on uh, the next 40% would, that would account to hopefully close to 100% of the abnormal proteins in the spinal fluid. But if you could prop up uh, cells that are partially dying after damage to this, uh, to the myelin and to the axon, uh, that would be helpful. But then if also you could replace or repair the myelin, that would be important. And then finally, if cells are lost uh, through damage from MS, could you potentially replace them? And that's re uh, neuroregeneration. And uh, when I was in training, um, you would have been thought to be a little bit on the nut side if you uh, were talking about this because 
the cells that were needed to replace the damaged cells were not felt to be even in the brain or spine. That has changed completely. So now there, we're very much at the beginning of doing studies where you would take stem cells, not bone marrow derived stem cells. We already do that. And we, that's just another way that you would try to affect the adaptive immune system, which is very successful, but has risks associated with it. We don't use it on a routine basis and there are still ongoing studies, but these are neural based, uh, based stem cells. And um, uh, a uh, physician researcher in Italy named uh, Dr. Puccino about 10 years ago showed in animal models of MS that you could take these stem cells, which have gone down the lidge. Oh, I get to use a whiteboard. Do I have a marker? Oh, there you go. There we go. So um, if you think it, think about it, the perfect stem cell is just a fertilized egg to make an entire human being. So let's say you got your fertilized egg up here. And then the cells that derive from that will come uh, into various lineages. And there'll be a kidney lineage. There'll be a lung lineage. There'll be a skin lineage. There'll be a bone marrow lineage. Etc. There will be a hair lineage, but there more, most importantly will be a nervous system lineage. And so we call the cells that are going down through these processes of changing and some lineages dying off and others coming up, just differentiation. They'll differentiate and change over time, but ultimately they'll make a kidney, they'll make a liver, they'll make skin, etc. They'll be fully differentiated. So um, the concept would be what we do now is we use bone marrow derived stem cells that are probably sort of up in this range up in here. And those can, if you remove the present bone marrow and present lymph, uh, lymphoid cells you have throughout your body, you could replace them with naive stem cells and hopefully reboot your immune system. If you want to regenerate nervous tissue though, you're going to need to use these cells, the ones that are in the nervous system lineage. And um, so there have been a couple of studies so far that have literally uh, taken cells, usually from someone's um, either bone marrow or uh, more typically from skin or muscle or uh, fat cells. And then you can actually, let's say you have something in the lineage of skin here. You can actually treat them in such a way that they go backwards to become a fully functional stem cell. And then they make them go out another lineage. And so someone won the Nobel Prize, a Korean researcher won the Nobel Prize for that about 15 years ago. And these are called inducible pluripotent stem cells. So now, and then you can grow up these cells and then you could potentially put them where you want to put them. Alternatively, another way that you could potentially do this, a one that's oftentimes a little bit more uh, challenging ethically is to take fetal stem cells. And actually fetal stem cells were done first because those were found earlier long before this process became available. So both of these techniques have been used uh, to try to create nervous system precursor cells or stem cells and, um, and then grow them up typically from one source so that they're all the same. Uh, and then to either inject them in the spinal fluid or in a paper that's more recent, this paper right here, um, that was published three days ago, uh, into a shunt that's put into the, into the brain proper that will deliver these cells into the ventricles deep in the middle of the brain, which is where the spinal fluid is made. And then they can circulate over the span, spine in the brain. So this, uh, this study that I'm referring to right here uh, was uh, reported from Italy, included Dr. Pluccino, who did the animal work that I mentioned. Um, and they took, uh, and they, there was actually, uh, in this case, a fetal uh, cell a transplant from a miscarried child, a 12-week-old um, fetus. Um, and you could take uh, brain cells from um, the fetus. You can uh, get rid of the stuff that you don't want, take the stem cells that you do want, grow them up, purify them. And then they were injected through this port into the ventricles. And then you can then monitor them to see if they survive, 
You can monitor them to see if they have produced any changes, uh, suggesting the um, effects on various cells, such as creation of growth factors and other things that would be relevant to um, making more cells that would then uh, potentially replace the damaged and killed cells from uh, a NEMAS attack previously. So in this particular study, uh, and again, these are phase one primarily safety studies. Phase two studies are when you have sort of figured out maybe what doses are appropriate, and they did four doses in this study. Uh, then you can do both safety and efficacy studies. And then phase three studies are the ones you get approval with from the FDA if everything is safe and effective. And uh, uh, so this is early on in the process. So in this case, they have 15 patients, uh, many of them with quite significant disability, wide range of ages, though, actually from the 20s to the 60s. Um, and they showed uh, that this actually was safe. There were no serious adverse events. There were no deaths. Um, they did include with this some immunosuppression because uh, these are cells that are not theirs. They're not them. So they uh, would have to um, suppress any uh, uh, immune system activation against the cells. Um, and, uh, and so what this was is a proof of principle that you can deliver the cells in this fashion. And in other studies that are similar, but using uh, the spinal fluid injection as opposed to using a port up into the ventricles directly, uh, people have shown that these cells do in fact uh, uh, emit various growth factors and other things that would be relevant to actually uh, stimulating cells that are already present in the brain and the spine to then fully differentiate and go down this track. So um, everything that I just said would have been considered complete science fiction until a few years ago. And, uh, and so the two advantages, so the two approaches, either using a, a miscarried fetus and or using these inducible pluripotent stem cells, both avoid the issue of using aborted uh, tissue, which of course uh, causes some ethical issues in a variety of places. So um, they offer a significant advantage in that regard. Um, and so uh, there are at least four places, uh, New York, uh, multiple places in the United States is the second. Uh, these, uh, the two that I just mentioned recently uh, are both from Italy. And so others I think are also doing this. So we'll see where this goes. Uh, these are very early, um, but it's, um, incredibly interesting and uh, potentially profound uh, that you would maybe be able to literally grow nervous tissue. And so if that is the case, that would be uh, astounding and would be a major potential leap forward, especially for patients who have some significant fixed disability already. But it's very early. All right, so that's all that I wanted to talk about in terms of um, stuff that uh, is sort of new. There's, there's always many other newer things as well, but those I thought were um, uh, pretty interesting ones. Um, so I'm going to start uh, doing questions. Does anybody have any questions about that? Okay. Um, oh, sure, go ahead. They actually can become, there's three, sort of three classes of cells, they're really sort of two classes, but three when you break them out separately. Classes of cells in the brain and the spine, the neurons, which are the basic cells, the actual nerve cells themselves. And then we have glial cells and the glial cells can fall into two broad categories. Uh, the astroglia, which are uh, astrocytes, the most prominent uh, supportive cells. And they provide a variety of nutrients and do a variety of other things. They're also, also immune-based cells as sort of a second job. Um, and then the oligodendroglia, uh, and the oligodendroglia are the ones that actually make um, uh, the myelin wrapping. Uh, the microglia are actually part of the immune system, but they are also in the brain and they're not part of that lineage. So um, uh, these cells uh, uh, have been treated in such a way that they uh, carry the information that's available to uh, transmit various growth factors and other things that would either differentiate cells that they've actually been injected along with them or the cells that are already in the brain and the spine 
that are just waiting for signals to say, hey, com continue down this pathway to make your cells. And so both are probably possible. It's actually considered it's more likely that they're actually stimulating the cells that are already present inside the nervous system. And beyond that, I'm not, I, I don't know if I can answer your question. <laughs> it may be above my pay grade a little bit. Yeah. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, so, the quest that, so that question was, by the way, how, how might this work? And so that was what led to that. And it is an answer to the follow-up question. It's very early. And so the uh, so-called mechanistic studies uh, will be important to try to understand how does A go to B, B goes to C, C goes to D. Um, all right, so um, I'm, I'm going to pop around because these are these are sort of all in different orders, uh, but uh, they're all uh, going to sort of hang together over time. Uh, there was a question about fatigue and fatigue that may fluctuate over the course of the day, and the question was about well, what happens if you're having a bad day and you know you 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 run down and your fatigue is getting you and it's limiting your function? What do you do at that time? And the simple answer is you take a break. And you can do it a variety of different ways. You can literally just sit down and rest. Uh, if it's a hot day, you can cool off with a cool drink or go inside air conditioning or just get cool whatever way you can. Uh, you can take a nap, you can meditate, you can do a variety of things that just sort of brings up all the, uh, all the activity levels down. There's no other magic pill or other thing like that that is available at this point in time that can change that. And partly that's because fatigue is probably many different things in MS uh, and, um, and is not always just from MS. So there might be other uh, conditions or comorbidities that are relevant as well. The biggest ones being sleep problems, thyroid problems, anemia, B12 deficiency, and a whole host of other things. Uh, the biggest probably being sleep disorders. So the other thing you can do in the long run is just get the best sleep possible and exercise uh, so that as to try to avoid the fatigue, the best thing to probably treat fatigue is probably exercise. Um, we do use a variety of medications to treat fatigue. Um, uh, the studies supporting their use is not great. Um, they are clearly of use to some people and, uh, and we try several different classes of medications to help with fatigue. Um, but I, I've been more impressed the longer I've been doing this that uh, it's much more important to just treat your body well and exercise, sleep well, eat well, and you will do better. There was a related question about Adderall. Um, some have been using Adderall for a while uh, and Adderall has been used and other stimulants uh, like Ritalin and Concerta and Vyvanse and others have been used, sort of co-opted from uh, use for uh, ADHD. Um, and some people, I, I truly think, do benefit from them, but they have a lot of side effects. Um, they're highly addictive in my interpretation and many others. Um, they cause a lot of insomnia, and nausea, tremulousness, and other side effects. And, and perhaps even more importantly, uh, there's a huge shortage of them in the last year. Very, very difficult to get. I'm not sure exactly what led to this. I don't know if it was increased usage or some problem at the factories, but there's been a significant shortage for months uh, of just certain doses of Adderall. Um, so uh, when this person had been using this, went to a new doctor, and the new doctor said, I'm not going to give that to you. They don't, they don't like to prescribe it. And I, I similarly don't like to prescribe it, but I also am practical. And if someone's been on it for 10 years, it's kind of difficult to just take them off cold turkey. So I try to look for alternative ways to help with fatigue and maybe to understand the fatigue better and make sure that uh, it wasn't just simply someone said I have fatigue and they got given a drug. I try to understand the fatigue better and try to uh, maybe address some of the other underlying causes that contribute. So um, the question was, why wouldn't my doctor, my new doctor, give me the Adderall? And, and that's probably why. Um, related to that, there's, uh, there's frequently a lot of questions about diet. Um, diet is important. We think um, we know that certain things are true. Um, uh, especially related to uh, obesity. Obesity is a risk factor for developing MS. Obesity is a risk factor for having more difficult time with MS. It also causes secondary problems with um, higher risk of diabetes, high blood pressure, uh, 
joint problems and other things that can play a role in someone's uh, not functioning as well with their MS. Um, so diet does matter. We do think it's important, but it's incredibly hard to do a true dietary study. Uh, when we do a pharmaceutical study, you have maybe a placebo or drug A, and then you have drug B, and uh, you randomize people to the two different arms, and you check to make sure there's the same number of women and the same average age and you know, the same sort of time from onset of MS and all these other factors, and they sort of fall out, and they look about the same in the two groups, and then the only thing you change is drug A and drug B, and then you ascribe everything that happens after that to drug A or to drug B. And you sort of ignore, well, is everybody, I mean, we frequently don't get BMIs, we don't get smoking histories, we don't get exercise histories, we don't get a lot of things that could play a role in the outcomes of the studies. We just assume that those are, are similar. If you're doing a dietary study, in theory, if you had the same pharmaceutical model, you'd have group A have the exact same food intake for two years or longer, and group B a different same exact food for two years or longer that is just never going to happen in addition um, nobody wins at the end of that unfortunately that is there's no large pharmaceutical company that's going to invest a hundred million dollars to do a proper study because they don't win at the end there's no drug to sell or anything or something maybe kroger would do it i'm not sure but um <laughs> but it, it's hard from a financial point of view and so uh, oftentimes it'd be the National Mess Society or NIH, thank you very much everybody for paying your taxes, and um, would have to be somebody else that would fund that. And it's just hard to do. It's, and so the question is, will we ever have a truly solid dietary study? I'm not sure. So given all those limitations, um, uh, I always preface to say there's no proven diet and uh, I'm not recommending any diet, but the best data that exists uh, is probably for uh, the MIND diet or the DASH diet, uh, sort of uh, DASH plus the Mediterranean diet. Uh, the DASH diet was originally uh, put together to try to help people uh, deal with their hypertension. That's the H in DASH. And the Mediterranean diet is primarily uh, revolving around diets similar to what we see in Mediterranean uh, uh, based on uh, or, uh, various uh, olive oils and other oils, uh, fish and other uh, veggies and fruits. Um, so there, there's not tremendous data supporting that, but if you're gonna say there's data supporting anything, that's probably as good as there is as anything. Um, um, Dr. Corbett, yes. I have a question from the audience. Okay. And it says, speaking of comorbidity, comorbidities, I understand that paying attention to cholesterol levels, blood pressure, and weight are important. What are other comorbidities and areas to monitor for MS patients? Um, those, those are the big, big ones. ones. The other ones, uh, another one would be smoking. Uh, smoking is um, often said to be the number one uh, cause of preventable disease in the United States and elsewhere for that matter. And actually we don't even smoke that much in the United States anymore, but Europe, man, everybody smokes. Um, and uh, so that's a big one. Uh, and then other uh, known orthopedic issues. So uh, knees, hips, backs, cervical spines. Um, uh, you can't necessarily prevent those, but you can treat your body uh, in such a way that you uh, pay attention to that and or address it if it occurs. Uh, but the big ones are, are mostly related to vascular disease because vascular disease is a, a major problem uh, all around the world, but certainly in the United States. So diabetes, high blood pressure, cholesterol, smoking are the major risk factors for that. There's some inherited things, of course, that we can't change. So those are the uh, probably the biggest comorbid factors uh, that are relevant, but there, there can also be some other ones as well. Um, and um, Let's see, related to that, um, 20 years ago, uh, my former partner, Dr. Vollmer and I, and, and one other uh, friend at the University of South Carolina, Bill Tyre, uh, did the first ever study with Simvastat in multiple sclerosis. Simvastat is uh, one of the older, if not the oldest, uh, cholesterol lowering agent. So uh, Zocor is the trade name. And uh, we, uh, there was data from South Carolina, actually, with some physiologists there, that, uh, that these drugs were also potentially anti-inflammatory and had some um, uh, properties that would be uh, potentially useful for autoimmune-type conditions. 
So we did a very small study with only about 40 patients. And we sort of, uh, we did a wash in phase where we just checked how active their MRI scan was. Uh, started half the people on simvastatin. Actually, no, I'm sorry, this was open label. We put everybody on uh, simvastatin uh, to a maximum dose that they could tolerate, 60 milligrams, uh, and uh, and then measured their, what their MRI scans looked like after that. And there was a small but but actually countable drop in the number of active lesions that were seen on the scans. Uh, and this was published literally 18 or 20 years ago. Uh, subsequent to that, a number of uh, uh, also small studies were done in, in different populations related to MS, and there was sort of some wishy-washy kind of data and nothing that was really tremendous. But about five years ago, uh, a group primarily in England resurrected simvastatin and looking specifically at um, patients with progressive MS and looked at a variety of different outcome measures, including primarily uh, changes in brain volume loss or shrinkage of the brain, atrophy of the brain. And we know that atrophy of the brain is very important uh, in, in MS, starts very early and is persistent over time. And so they measured as their primary outcome measure whether or not there was a reduction in the amount of shrinkage that occurred if you treated people with simvastatin compared to placebo and showed there was a benefit. In addition, showed a benefit with regard to disability, disability progression you can measure in the uh, standard scale we use called EDSS and measured a variety of other things as well. And so on the basis of that, they, did, they started a second uh, study, which is still underway. And uh, so if that holds up like the first study looks, it is conceivable that the use of a very simple, well-known, well-tolerated medication like simvastatin that is cheap could be used as an add-on agent, it would be felt to be a, what's referred to as a neuroprotective agent. And there are a variety of other uh, compounds of various types, um, even alpha lipoic acid, which is just a simple supplement, and others that are potentially um, neuroprotective. And there's uh, one interesting, uh, it's not a molecule, it's a gold, uh, gold nanoparticles, uh, nanoparticles meaning like 10,000 of them on the width of one hair. So these are nanoparticles, uh, and these would potentially be uh, neuroprotective. And there's a company called Clean, Bio, uh, Clean Biosciences, uh, C-L-E-N-E, that is looking at, uh, looking at a neuroprotective component for that because it would, as I mentioned before, would potentially pump up energy production inside partially damaged cells. So um, that's uh, a funny way to have thought about what uh, you know an old drug might do, but there are other drugs that similarly might be either helpful for remyelination or for neuroprotection, including metformin, a well-known drug that's been used in diabetes for years. Uh, uh, it's cheap, it's um, generic, uh, and there are some small studies that are being looked at there as well. So that's repurposing of um, old cells that would uh, old drugs rather that would potentially help maintain cellular integrity and, and energy production over time. I had a question about alpha lipoic acid. Uh -huh. uh, they asked, what is the current recommended daily dose of alpha lipoic acid per the high dose study? Could the lack of taking alpha lipoic acid be the cause of an increase in lower extremity neuropathy? So, uh, so the question is, um, what is the role of alpha lipoic acid uh, as of today? Um, and the, the real answer is none because we don't really... Um, uh, have enough studies that would support its use. There is a preliminary study that was done primarily at the Oregon VA. Um, and uh, and a second, again, similarly, a second study is underway that was very similar to the simvastatin study. And the dosage that is used in the study is 1,200 milligrams a day. I think it's 400 three times a day, I believe. Um, and uh, we'll see if, in fact, that has an impact uh, in progressive MS. Similar to the simvastatin study, the main outcome in the original study and in the second study is primarily focused on brain volume shrinkage, and uh, but it has a number of other outcomes. But if the concept is that this, and these are being done in progressive MS patients, so relatively older patients with slow worsening independent of relapse activity, uh, the concept would be as if your numbness is getting worse, your pain is getting worse, or whatever symptoms related to um, nerve damage. There's water right there. There you go. Um, then uh, this would potentially, this would potentially uh, help limit the the worsening of that over time. It would not. It would probably probably not 
um, treat the symptom to make it better, unfortunately, but it would uh, hopefully stop worsening that would occur over time. So we'll see. I'm a little surprised. I would have expected to see the alpha lipoic acid and the simfacetin studies done already, but they have not been completed. And I haven't seen anything at meetings about them even. Um, let's see. Um, there was a, uh, a number of questions about um, progressive MS. And so uh, why don't we tackle that one next? So uh, in the old days, and if you came to the educational seminar a couple of weeks ago, this was my talk. Um, in the old days, we had this sort of, um, in the old, old days, let's go back even further, there was just MS. And the original, you know, uh, Jean-Marie Charcot studies from 1860, which uh, categorized the clinical association with the pathology of patients who had died, uh, at least in part due to their MS, so the clinical pathological correlation is what Charcot gets credit for. Um, everyone was just one big pile, it was just MS. Over time, it became clear that there were differences in how MS sort of acted. And uh, when studies were originally done though, with various different drugs or other uh, devices or other things, there was no separation. Everyone was just MS and you just got treated. What happened about 35 years ago, 40 years ago, was people asked the question uh, with, with a lot of um, uh, prior work suggesting that this was an autoimmune condition, whether or not immune-based therapies would be helpful. And from pathology, it was known that uh, younger patients with, uh, with relapses had much more inflamed looking brains. And so we started to see a division in how the studies were done. And a lot of studies were done with relapsing younger patients with these uh, immune-based therapies and showed benefit. And once one showed a benefit, then that became the norm. Uh, and then after a few drugs got approved, then people said, well, why don't we try these out in the progressive MS patients? With this concept that they were almost like two different pots of, of, uh, of patients. And most of those studies were unfortunately negative. The vast majority of them have been negative. And this really gets at the concept that there are two different things that are going on at the same time pathologically. Um, uh, the one that is arguably more important uh, is uh, this, this concept that you would have uh, the microglia and other cells, especially in the outer rim of the brain, and then associated with, le with um, what are known as B cell follicles in the lining of the brain as outside the brain proper in the lining of the brain, the meninges that are sort of attached onto the brain but are separate from the brain. Um, that there's an interaction between uh, these and all of the so-called the, the gray matter, the neurons, the actual nerve cells, not the oligodendrocytes that make the, that make the actual myelin. And that there's this low level of inflammation uh, that goes on from the very beginning and uh, continues throughout time. And it's variable, like everything else in MS, it's variable between people. And some people have a lot of that and some people don't have much. And so that even in younger people, not children, but you know, adults and above. Um, when you see a change on someone's exam over time, the old, the old concept would be, well, that's because that young person had a relapse and then he didn't fully recover and they had a change in their exam. The reality is, is that about 80% of the changes on exam, even in young people, is due to progression that is independent of a relapse. And it's because of this burbling sort of sub rosa uh, inflammation that's going on. And then the second part is what everybody sees is, is sort of the relatively the bright, shiny object, these relapses that they're very dramatic. Someone might lose vision in their eye or not be able to walk that happened relatively suddenly and, and appropriately so gets a lot of attention. Um, uh, but those are actually very easily treated. We can shut them down with steroids. We know many of the medications that we use uh, dramatically reduce the number of relapses and the number of scan changes associated with those. Those are relatively easily treated because the medicines that we have actually deal with the so-called adaptive immune system. Whereas the medicines that we really want and need from a disability point of view that progresses over the lifetime of a patient with MS would really be having a bigger impact on microglia and other things that have been burbling along the whole way. So this concept of PIRA, progression independent of relapse activity, has has a number of problems associated with it in terms of mostly the way we measure it, what we do with it. 
but it has brought forth the idea uh, that challenged the concept uh, that MS was a inflammatory condition when you're young and a degenerative condition when you're old. In fact, that degeneration has been occurring throughout and it's also related to inflammation, just a different type of inflammation. So, um, and that's what's led to now these studies with, for example, the BTK inhibitors and whatnot that would uh, potentially have an impact on the innate immune system. So that's the backdrop of the pathology and, and how it is um, our view of the world has changed in terms of not this binary thing, but really more of a continuous model over time. Does that happen as... Right. Right. Yeah, so the question is, uh, what's the relationship of age to what I just described? And it's a really important uh, relationship because, yep, pretty much everybody in this room has a shrinking brain. Um, after about age 30, uh, everybody's brain starts to shrink because there are a variety of normal factors that are ongoing uh, and, and in which many people are very interested to try and understand better. Um, that result in drop out of brain cells. Uh, and you have the same issue in your liver and your kidney and your skin. Um, there is a degeneration that occurs over time and drop out of cells in different organs all over your body. So uh, you can think of so-called secondary progressive MS as in part this underlying process that I described with aging thrown on top of it. And, uh, and whether or not, you know, there are hormonal factors that make a difference. Uh, you know, it's interesting that a lot of these changes occur around the time of menopause, for example, in women, and what role that plays. Uh, and men also have menopause, right? I mean, they lose testosterone as they age, what role that plays. So um, aging probably plays a very important role. So a lot of the questions uh, revolved around uh, what do you do uh, you know, in that context, what do you do if you have so-called secondary progressive MS? You've gone through a period of time where maybe you had relapses. The relapses have really stuttered and stopped. You maybe haven't had a relapse for some time. You're slowly worsening primarily typically with gait and also potentially with cognitive function and a few other things as well are more typical, but many things could be. And, um, uh, and there's not great data that the presently available disease modifying therapies or DMTs have much of an impact. What do you do in that context? So one question is, if that's the case, how long do you continue to use drug X that you may be on? Um, and is there any data that can support whether or not it's important to stay on or go off? Um, and that's where the DISCO MS study came in. Um, and when we did the DISCO MS study, uh, for those of you who are not aware of it, it's a randomized controlled blinded trial where as people age, and because we know this natural history where relapses diminish over time, where scans uh, have new lesions that are less, uh, less important over time, uh, that there's very little evidence that the medicines work over the age of 55, mostly because those patients have been excluded from the studies and or the studies that included older patients, many of those studies were negative, and or if you did a subgroup analysis in these studies that people have clearly benefited the most with the presently available drugs, were the younger patients and they had reason, recent disease activity either with a superimposed relapse on top of their slow progression, which can absolutely happen. You can have relapses in your 70s um, and or recent MRI activity. Many studies show that the people that benefit the most from the drugs, that's who benefits the most. And concurrently, the flip side of that is also true. If people go off drugs, and there are numerous, there's probably 25 observational studies, not randomized controlled trials, but just observational studies and databases of people that go off drug uh, for many different reasons. And then you say, okay, well, let's follow them in the database and see what happened to them and, uh, and see who had new disease activity, either had worsening progression on their exam or had a relapse or had new scan changes or went back on a medication. And when you look, not surprisingly, the people who had more disease recurrence were younger patients who uh, had a relapse somewhere near to the time they went off drug and had a change on their scan somewhere near the time they went off their drug. Older people who hadn't had a relapse for a long period of time and or people that did not have recent um, 
relapses or scan changes, we're much less likely to have new disease activity and go back on drugs. So in order to do this in a fashion that we could say we did this uh, the best we could, we did the DISCO-MS study, a randomized controlled blinded trial. We picked a specific age. You had to be at least 55. And you had to have not had a relapse for at least five years, not as have a scan change for at least three years. Um, and you had to be uh, on active treatment for at least five years. And what we got in this, and half the people stayed on their drug, and half the people got randomized go off. And this, you could be on any drug as long as it was FDA approved. And um, so we recruited uh, 259 patients, roughly split half and half between the two groups, discontinue versus continue. The average age was actually 63. Uh, the average time since the last relapse was 14 years. So these were stable people. 75% were still on old injectable drugs, copaxone, the interferons, uh, even though that does not represent the present state of who's using what drugs in the United States. Uh, which is much lower than 25, uh, 75%. It's more like 15 to 20% are using those drugs. And uh, we followed people for two years and measured relapses, measured uh, any new scan changes, measured changes on exam, measured cognitive function, measured patient report outcomes, quality of life, patient satisfaction with the treatments that they were on, and other things, symptom scores, other things. And found that, in fact, there was... Uh, uh, and, and the way you do the study is you try and show that the new treatment, in this case going off drug, is not inferior to the standard treatment, which is staying on drug. And that's a different model than trying to prove that uh, drug A is better than placebo or drug A is better than drug B. Uh, it's a different statistical uh, pattern, and you um, analyze it differently. And in the study, we had the primary outcome measure was either any new dot on your brain scan or a relapse. Either one would count as an outcome. And there were very few outcomes in the study over two years. Uh, there were uh, less than 10% of people uh, taken as a whole over the 259 patients had any either relapse or scan change. Um, and very few relapses occurred and no difference between the groups. But if you take the primary outcome measure, either a scan change or a relapse, we actually couldn't show that it was not inferior. It wasn't inferior, but we couldn't show it was not inferior. We got a sort of in-between result. And we got the in-between result because there was a very small number, but countable, uh, increased risk of having one or two new dots on your brain scan uh, in the discontinued group compared to the continued group in this population. Um, those changes on MRI scan were not associated with relapses, were not associated with changes on exam or anything else. So they were just like many new dots on the brain scan, um, asymptomatic. So um, we then did an extension of the DISCO-MS uh, study with a subset of the people from the original study. They had to have been at uh, the, top 10, uh, the top 10 sites that did recruitment because we only had a limited amount of money. Uh, they had to have completed the first study. They needed to have stayed on their original assignment, on drug or off drug. And they had to have not already hit the primary outcome measure because we didn't want to count them again. Uh, and in fact, two people got um, mistakenly put into the study because they had already hit the primary outcome measure. But we had 74 people in this, in this uh, phase of the study, 30 who were uh, still on drug and 44 who uh, remained off drug. And in the extension now out to 40 months, uh, there was no uh, new relapse amongst this population. And only three out of the 40, uh, 74 uh, had uh, any new MRI activity. And all the other things I mentioned before were, again, no different between the groups, except for people who are more satisfied being off drug. Um, so, uh, you know, we lost statistical power with that few number of people, but it was pretty clear there was no sudden resurgence, you know, uh, another year and a half later uh, with new disease activity when people were uh, followed out a longer period of time. So that gets at the question, though, um, how many of those patients had progressive MS? Not that many. The majority, 83%, had um, had uh, run of the mill what were called relapsing MS by their prime, by their doctor, their you know their their usual doctor. And um, interestingly, in spite of that, um, the exact same percentage of people who had progressive MS or relapsing MS had a change on their exam during the study it was 11.7% exactly the same in each group. So even 
even though they were called relapsing MS, they had the exact same risk of having progression of disability on or off drug. Relapsing or progressive, progressive, it didn't matter. And so and in addition, whereas in younger patients, about 80% of people have progression independent of relapse activity, and our group was 93%. And so in older individuals, progression of disability is almost always independent of relapses because there are so few relapses. Uh, and so uh, uh, that would argue that what you call them, progressive MS, relapsing MS or whatever, probably doesn't matter. They're gonna have the same risk of having disability progression regardless. And it's gonna probably not matter if you're on drug in that population. Um, what do you do with someone who's diagnosed at 58? First, you know, they have their first or second attack at 58. They clearly have active disease. Well, we put them on the drug because they're, they're just sort of frame shifted up in the age category. So the question is, um, uh, I'll reframe your question. The question was, was there any difference within the study, uh, given that the ages were 55 to, I think, 73 or so? Was all that new activity in the 55-year-olds, or was it spread out across the 55 to 72-year-olds? And the answer was it was spread out. So that was actually um, something we didn't talk about much in the paper, in the discussion. Uh, Partly there was just so little activity, we really couldn't do a lot of subgroup analysis. Uh, but the reality was, is that, for example, there were four relapses total uh, and, the, uh, and the ages were one was 55, one was 62, one was 65, and one was 72 or something like that. I forget what it was, but the average age was virtually identical to the general population. And then the same thing was true for the, uh, for the scan changes. So we didn't see, surprisingly, more activity in the younger patients, but I think it's because uh, maybe that Rubicon has been crossed, that river has been crossed. And the reality is, is there's so little activity anyway. And uh, we pre-selected a very inactive group. Sure, go ahead. Uh, we didn't ask which particular benefits patient, uh, so the question is what, uh, what were the benefits of being off drug in the study? We didn't ask what people perceived to be the benefits. We just asked them, were they, uh, were they satisfied with their treatment assignment? And so uh, at the beginning of the study, they were almost identical in the two groups because of course they were still, they were all on drug at the beginning of the study. And then over the course of the study, the number went slowly up in the group that was off drug and stayed almost exactly the same in the people who were on drug. And so um, uh, that's also interesting because we did a side study that looked, uh, we surveyed NARCOMS. If you're familiar, I don't know if anybody here is in NARCOMS, North American Research Committee on MS. And it's a database that is patient driven. Um, it's uh, uh, a sub, uh, an offshoot of the consortium of the MS centers uh, and they house the data. And uh, individuals uh, can put all their information in there by their age, you know, and everything about their MS and if they're on drug, et cetera. But you can also interrogate this like 35,000 person database and ask them questions. So we asked a thousand people questions who look like our, our disco population. And interestingly enough, we asked, would you be interested in going off your medication? And these are people who looked a lot like our patient population. They're a little bit younger, but they're very similar to our, our patient population. Two thirds said, no, thank you. 20% said maybe, and 12% said yes. So that explains why it took us 5,500 patients to be screened to get 259 patients for our study. There's a great fear of going off the medication, and I totally get that. I mean, it's kind of a hard sell because some, a lot of these patients were on the same drug for 15 years. So you're tolerating the medication, at least enough to keep taking it. You're doing well. You haven't had a relapse in an average of 14 years. And then we come along and say, hey, what do you think? You want to go off that? And um, uh, so um, did that change after the study? I think it did a little bit uh, because when we did the extension study, you had to have remained on the same assignment, either on drug or off drug to be a candidate. And we had a mismatch. There were only 30 people 
who remained on drugs and 44 who remained off drug. Why? Because many more people went off drug after the, you know, the first people to hear about the study results were the patients in the study. And uh, many more people went off drug than people who were off drug went back on drug. And so that's why we had a mismatch. And um, we asked people at the end of the extension, uh, what are your plans? Are you gonna stay on? If you're on drug, are you gonna stay on or not? 100% for, for uh, who the people who went off, 100% said staying off. And when we asked the people who were uh, on drug, if they were gonna stay on drug, 86% uh, said yes. And so they, they had a couple different opportunities to go off. They could have gone off during the trial, they could have gone off before the trial, during the trial, after the trial, and they still didn't go off. And so there's a, a significant group of people who are probably never gonna wanna go off. And I get that. I mean, I'm, I'm not being critical. I'm just saying that's just you know reality that um, people struggle with the concept to go off a drug that's seemingly helping them. And uh, and we could argue to a blue in the face that it's probably not doing much, and that's just the natural history. But it's still a tough sell. So um, so with regard to progression, so the, the, a lot of the questions related to. Um, can you go off, you know, if you're continuing to progress while you're on the drug or even heaven forbid, better yet, if you're stable, um, but as you get older, can you go off the drug if you have progressive MS? There's very little data that gets at that directly in that population. There is a study in France, however, that um, is very similar to our study, uh, except it's being done in people over the age of 50 who do have secondary progressive MS, but they have to be without a relapse or a scan change for a, I think it's three years. Um, and then they're gonna be followed for two years. And that data should report out in about another mm, two years or so. There was a third study, a randomized controlled trial, taking people off drug that accepted people as low as 18. So you could have been diagnosed at 13, stable for five years, now you're 18. And it went up 18 to no maximum age. And then, um, you know, otherwise it looked like our study. And that study was stopped early because they had way too much new disease activity. So I think, uh, I think what we showed uh, with the, at least those first two studies, well, the first and third study, not the secondary progressive study, was that somewhere between what they were doing and what we were doing, um, there's probably a sweet spot in there somewhere because we had virtually no new disease activity. I mean, so we had essentially about 4% of people had any new disease activity annually on drug or off drug in our study. But again, that's a very restricted population of people. Um, there are also uh, questions about how do you, um, how do you identify progressive MS and specifically a question about using MRI to address, to address that? Um, it's, uh, it's a challenge and as I suggested with the DISCO data, um, maybe a challenge that not everybody meets uh, as to how we actually recognize that people are slowly progressing. Um, I would argue that the doctors are not terribly good at it. Um, and in our study, as I mentioned, uh, we had the exact same number of people progressing disability on their exam who had either so-called relapsing MS or progressive MS, identical, exactly 11.7%. And so, um, that suggests um, many things are possible, but I think the answer is, is that they were just not recognized as having progressive MS. The, the tool we use, the EDSS, is not very good. It's a very blunt tool. You would probably want to do m multiple other things, and now it's become more of a fashion to use multiple different uh, uh, tools, such as a time 25-foot walk, a nine-hole peg test where you move, literally move pegs, nine, nine of them from one side to the other side, independently uh, with the two hands separately. Uh, and you time that and you can, and then you can also add a cognitive test. And you can also add a visual test. You can also add uh, MRI tests. You could add, add uh, not just a new brain lesion, but you could add, for example, brain volume loss. Um, and so you could add many other things that you could potentially measure, uh, including biomarkers in the blood. And there was a study published very recently that looked at, um, a neurofilament light. You may have heard us talk about this uh, quite a bit in these seminars. 
And it is a, uh, this is a protein that actually sits inside the axon, the, uh, the actual nerve cable. And if that's damaged, it gets leaked out. You can measure the spinal fluid in the blood. Uh, and you can show that neurofilament light is elevated in patients, age and uh, sex match controls, and actually kidney function, BMI, and a few other controls, um, compared to people that don't have MS. It's elevated. It's elevated before people get diagnosed with MS. It's elevated before uh, people have a relapse. It's elevated before people have an MRI scan change that is uh, ominous for having a relapse. It's a very early marker. Um, and so um, a study was done recently, two studies of interest were, were done recently. One where um, you could look at individuals who were um, at various stages in their MS and check their neurofilament light level and then follow them over time. And you could see that either having a higher neurofilament light or having a change where your neurofilament light went up was associated with progression of disability on your exam over time. In addition, the flip side was published just a couple of weeks ago uh, from the Harvard group from the long-term um, database uh, called CLIMB. And uh, they have a whole bunch of people who have been drawing blood on them for 20 years. They have stored blood and they can do this study, which we unfortunately did not, we did not have in the disco. And so they asked a simple question for all the people that they had that were on drug and then went off drug, did they have a, a neurofilament light level before they went off and then after they went off? And if there was, uh, and did, a change in elevation in that neurofilament light predict having new disease activity. And in fact, it did. So we would have loved to have that in a disco and they sort of did that with their database though. So showing that, you know, maybe a marker like that would be useful. But the question that we got here was whether or not you can see anything on MRI scans because the, the, the two big mismatches with MRI and clinical activity in MS are early on, people are not having relapses and yet we'll check their brain scan. They have new lesions on their scan. They're asymptomatic. They're like, well, what the heck is going on there? Um, when people are older, especially when they have progressive MS, they are progressive. They, you can clearly see that they are worsening over time. And yet the MRI scan doesn't change. We're like, wait a minute, what's that? There's, there's a reverse mismatch. And, um, and it tells us a little bit about the limitations of what the MRI scan can show us. The MRI scan does not show everything. And so there has been a huge amount of effort into coming up with better markers of progressive disease in MRI scans. And so one uh, that, that is useful, but you can probably only use in large populations is slowly expanding lesions, cells, if you will. And then there's also something called phase rim lesions. Now phase rim lesions, you can do with certain sequences. And these are uh, seen actually throughout MS, but they're seen uh, absolutely um, in people with progressive MS as well. Uh, and so uh, perhaps those would be useful. Uh, if we develop any technologies that can um, uh, see a little bit more at the cellular level, what the myelin looks like or what the axons look like, that might be useful. But that is one of the problems that we have is we don't have an easily identifiable marker um, for what we call progressive MS. And we need better markers for that to understand it. And then even maybe have a target from that. Um, Dr. Corbett, yes. I do have a question about um, progressive, secondary progressive MS. Does a later in life diagnosis around age 50 of relapsing remitting MS have any bearing on when or if you will transition into secondary progressive MS? Yeah, yeah. and uh, uh, they can hear the question I hear then. Okay, yeah. so, so, um, so, so uh, we've, it's been known for a long time that if you were diagnosed as a child, 100% of the time you have simple run of the mill relap relapsing MS, period. Um, as you age, uh, and, and it's mostly um, uh, after puberty, it's uh, four to one women to men. Um, as you age, those two things change. In middle age, it's maybe 60, 40 women to men. Uh, and it's about, as opposed to 15% of people who have primary progressive MS total and 0% who have primary progressive MS in kids, 
it's about, again, about 60, 40 relapsing MS to progressive MS if you're diagnosed in middle age. Uh, so you're more like, if you're diagnosed in middle age, you're more likely to be a guy and you're more likely to be with progressive MS from the outset. That begs then the question that we just got. What about if you're diagnosed late in life, relatively, after 50 is about 6% or 7%, after 60 is about one, uh, it's actually less than 1% uh, with new symptoms after 60 for the first time. Uh, and you're diagnosed with routine run-of-the-mill relapsing MS. What does that do to your risk of developing secondary progressive MS? It's, uh, that's a little bit fuzzier. Um, it probably doesn't change it that much. What's really, um, what's changed our understanding of the percentage of people that go into a secondary progressive phase with MS are two things. Uh, one, we're actually diagnosing people that we probably never would have diagnosed before. Um, with MRI especially, a lot of people have relatively modest MS. Uh, I hate to use this word benign because I don't ever think you should call MS benign. But um, uh, individuals who would have been diagnosed at autopsy in the old days were now diagnosing because they have a little bit of numbness in their hands. Somebody gets an MRI scan and go, wow, you have MS. Um, so that's partly it. And those people just never go on to have progressive MS. You don't count them. Uh, the second thing is that we now have highly effective therapies, and we've been using therapies for 30 years. And uh, the data that exists, as hard as it is to gather, would suggest that that has changed the number of people that go into a progressive phase. So how does that relate to being an, a later age onset? Well, the data that exists, and again, it's not great data, the data that exists suggests if you're diagnosed in middle age uh, after, say, after 50, so that's called late onset MS, um, uh, the medicines uh, don't appear to work as well. The biggest reason that probably is is because there's a relatively high number of individuals with primary progressive MS. Uh, but it also probably includes people who do go into secondary progressive MS. They've had relapses, a couple of relapses, but then they go into secondary progressive MS relatively early. So not a 100% answer uh, on uh, secondary progressive MS. Uh, I think it probably doesn't matter uh, in, a, in a sense of would you treat or not treat. I think it, uh, if someone has uh, markers that would suggest that they would be benefited by treatment, we treat them regardless of their age. And I've had people have their first attack in their 70s and we treat them because that is a risk factor for having new attacks. And that's what the drugs treat well. Um, there was one um, question. It's a sort of a one-off. What are the risks of changing to, from rituximab to ochreous? None. Um, and we did that study. We don't, we, yeah, we don't have that many, we don't have that many people that have done that. Okay. Uh, so the, uh, the question is what about the reverse going from Ocris to rituximab? Um, we started using rituximab, we and others began using rituximab 15 plus years ago, long before Ocris became available. They're very, very similar molecules. They kill the B cells the same way. The outcomes are the same in the studies. The biggest difference is the price between them. And um, so, when Ocrevus became available, Genentech, the maker of Ocrevus and Rituximab, uh, wanted to show that it's okay to switch from Rituximab to Ocrevus, and we did that study. And uh, the main outcome was, was there any difference in um, infusion reactions? And there weren't any differences in re infusion reactions. And we did not do a long-term study to see if there are differences, although there are, there is a study being done, I think, in Spain or Italy, where they're looking at Rituximab versus Ocrevus in a direct head-to-head -head trial. Um, very few people would have gone back in the other direction. So only people who were uh, treated with Ocrevus for the first time after 2017, or if they're in the studies done before then, would have had the opportunity to go to rituximab. Now I have moved uh, quite a few people from Ocrevus to rituximab for the simple reason um, that when you, because the drug's so expensive, Ocrevus is so expensive, uh, you cannot get an insurance company to pay for it to use it at a different rate. Uh, and so with rituximab, I mean, I can inject that into your eyeball every day if I want to because it's off-label and uh, nobody cares. Um, so, uh, and we're not injecting eyeballs ever. Um, <laughs> but the point is we have much more flexibility in dosage and how often you use it. So when people have had this wearing off phenomenon, say in the last month before their uh, Ocrevus infusion comes on, um, we have frequently then said, okay, well, let's switch you to rituximab. We'll just give it to you every four months. And then that makes the wearing off issue go away. 
So that's a, a distinct advantage of rituximab other than being remarkably cheap. Um, it's, um, it gives us much more flexibility in how we use it. Um, let's see. There was a question again, another sort of one-off. Uh, Long-term studies, 15 to 20 years or more of the injectable therapies, have, have they ever been studied? Are there any studies being planned? Uh, there have been studies uh, even out to 20 years. The original beta serum trial, which was published in 1992, and then beta serum got approved and started getting used in 1993, a 20-year follow-up was done with 97% ascertainment. That is, they, it was mostly done by telephone. They got a hold of 97% of people from 20 years ago of the living ones um, uh, and uh, showed uh, a decrease in mortality uh, with beta serum for the people that um, started on beta serum originally compared to the people that started on placebo originally. Um, so there have been some studies like that. Uh, and there were some other long-term studies with Copaxone and the other interferons and things like that, uh, you know, out to 10 or even 12 years. Um, and uh, in terms of will we see any more, the answer is no. There's so little usage of those drugs at this point that pretty much no one has any interest in it. So I, I can't imagine any drug company um, spending money to look at long-term studies of those drugs because nobody's using the drug pretty much. Um, wow. We did have another long-term question. This is uh -huh. not in, um, not Copaxone specifically, but just what if an older person um, who tolerates their medication stays on it long term? What are the effects on things like liver and fatigue? They didn't sure. specify which. Right. right. So, so uh, uh, we still do have, and, and you know, so in our group, I'm the one with the gray hair, um, and I'm the one who's been here 30 years. So I have a lot of older patients. I have a lot of patients I've seen for 25 years, and um, quite a few of them have done just fine on interferons and Copaxone and some of the older drugs. And that's, in fact, what we saw in the DISCO study as well. 75% of the patients were on old injectable drugs. So if they're doing okay, we leave them on it. We leave them on it. Now they're not going to get to 25 years on the drug if they're having liver problems or if they're having other problems. And usually with those drugs, it's injection-related issues uh, by far the most important. Um, Copaxone does not cause any long-term problems. Period. I mean that's why it's useful. And we, and I still once or twice a year put somebody on Copaxone um, because they want to stay on a drug. They've had trouble with some of the other drugs or they want to de-escalate from a higher effectiveness, but perhaps a uh, riskier medication. And we use it oftentimes in that case, either a Baggio or a Copaxone. I don't use the interferons. I haven't used an, uh, an interferon as a new drug since 2009 because the side effect profile is so much worse than Copaxone and the drugs are essentially equivalent in terms of their outcomes. It just wouldn't make sense to subject somebody to those side effects. If you're gonna use one of the old drugs, I would use Copaxone or a Baggio. Um, so we still do use the older drugs and Abaja, which are not, not so, uh, so old, um, because as I mentioned before, a lot of people are uncomfortable being off drugs. They wanna be on something. And even if it's treatment light, if you will, um, that is enough to help reassure them that and a, a unchanging brain MRI scan is very reassuring to people. And that plays a big role, obviously, what the patient thinks about it. We're not just coming out. And what I said to people all the time is, I'm not coming to your house in the middle of the night and then like lifting up your, you know, your nightgown and jabbing your leg with Copaxone. I mean, you have to want to do this. And, um, uh, and so that becomes a struggle the longer you have to do injections uh, because people absolutely get injection fatigue over time. Um, another related question with aging and longer use, is it safe to be, uh, to, to continue taking Tecfidera after 10 years, it works, but there is a concern about the risk of PML, the brain infection, uh, progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy uh, that's related to the JC virus, to which half the people in this room at least have been exposed and the other half maybe not. And um, uh, many of the drugs we use have some risk with it. It's relatively low risk with Tecfidera. It's a relatively high risk with, um, uh, with Jeleni and those uh, drugs like that still low though, and a really high risk with Tysabri. And oh, I should have mentioned also, for those of you who may be using Tysabri, um, there's now a biosimilar for, bio, uh, for Tysabri called Tyruco. So uh, at some point in the future, uh, with the assumption that they can get past the 28 patent battles that Biogen put up in front of them, 
uh, Tyruco may actually make it on the market as a biosimilar, which would make it cheaper to use. It's like a generic for a biological drug. Uh, and, um, uh, and then we'll see what happens with the insurance companies and how they respond to people on Tysabri. Will they sort of force people to use Tyruco? Uh, we see that a little bit with rituximab now. Uh, there are three, at least three uh, biosimilars for rituximab. And as, and as cheap as rituximab is, I mean, we can get rituximab for a couple hundred dollars a year at the VA because they get their own special pricing compared to the roughly, you know, eighty, ninety thousand dollars $90,000 a year it is for Ocrevus. Um, so a substantial difference. Um, and so the insurance companies, uh, not surprisingly, respond to that when there's a large savings that could occur. We might see that happen with Ocrevus, uh, which um, uh, now is going to have some direct headache competition with a, an approved drug, since rituximab is not approved for MS, but Brium-V, Ublituximab, is approved for MS, also twice a year infusion, deliberately marketed at a lower WAC cost. That's not that kind of WAC. It's the wholesale acquisition cost it is about um, 10 to 15% lower. And it's a faster infusion, so there's a shorter time in the chair, so that will make it cheaper as well. We'll see. Uh, the drug's only been approved for about a year, and with the next cycle of insurance changing in January is typically when we see if insurance companies start to, you know, get on top of us with their usual shenanigans about things they want us to do. Um, so, tech for dare, is it safe to continue to take it? As far as we know, the answer is yes. Um, there is some question as to whether or not being on the drug after the age of 50 increases that risk of developing PML if your JC virus test is positive. And, um, but probably the higher risk is whether or not your, your class of white blood cells, the lymphocytes, goes down too low. And so uh, studies have clearly shown that your lymphocytes will drop with Tecfidera, but they drop within 12, 6 to 12 months. And then after that, they flatten out. They don't change. Uh, and only about 2% of people go below a level that is considered worrisome for PML. And so um, the vast majority of people probably can continue to take tech for their after age 50 and for a prolonged period of time. Um, I talked about the BK, BTK drugs before. I talked about the Adderall. Well, this is a, this is an important question. This and this came up actually at another conversations in MS uh, in the summer. Um, and the question is: I recently had a Medtronic sacral implant to control my bowel and bladder. So far, I haven't noticed much difference. Are there other MS patients who have done this surgery, and has it been successful for them? So this is a variation on an electrical stimulator that has been used for a variety of different purposes in medicine. We use deep brain stimulators to help with tremor and Parkinson's and essential tremor. Uh, we use um, various nerve stimulators for uh, chronic pain in the back, for low back pain. Uh, we use them in the bladder for a variety of different reasons. Uh, and um, there is data supporting its use uh, for uh, bladder dysfunction with hyperactive bladder, uh, but it doesn't necessarily work in everyone. Like everything else, it's not perfect. And it might be a dose issue. You may have to change the stimulation, the amount that you do it. Uh, and so, um, I'd say I would go back to, uh, if this person is here tonight or, or listening, I would go back to your physician to put it in and, and ask them those questions and how they might adjust it. Um, a related question for implants. Uh, the most common implant we use is a baclofen pump for people with stiffness or spasticity in their legs or spasms in their legs that are unresponsive to oral therapies and or Botox and or stretching, which is always the first thing we should try. Um, then uh, you may have a back from pump put in. It's about the size of a hockey puck. Literally, it's almost identical to a hockey puck. I know because I'm a hockey player. And uh, uh, it has a catheter and you place it here under the skin. You thread it around and you literally puncture it through the dura around the spinal cord. You then sew it in and you sort of uh, have it go up the spinal canal. And then it drops tiny amounts of back within directly onto the spinal cord. So one one thousandth of the dose that we would use orally. Uh, and so that's very good because you can play with the dose. You're dropping it directly where it has its mechanism of action. You avoid a lot of the side effects that are taken when you take a systemic drug and it affects mostly sedation. And so these have been used for many, many years and they can be used also for pain. Uh, and so uh, you can put narcotics in there. You can put various other uh, lidocaine and other things in them as well. And so we use them for baclofen. Um, 
but the question was, uh, is there, can, you, can you put like other stuff in there to help me with other things? And the answer is yes, but the, you don't generally mix baclofen with another drug at the same time. So you'd probably have to have two pumps. Uh, and so I don't uh, think that's helpful. But there are often uh, are cases where you could substitute a topical, for example, pain medicine. Could you use uh, a lidocaine patch? Could you use capsation? Can you use other things where you don't have to take it orally? Because this question had to do with uh, someone having trouble taking a lot of pills. So there are other mechanisms to deliver drugs. Uh, you know, we have the same thing with uh, headaches. You can deliver uh, Imitrex subcutaneously, uh, orally, uh, another drug in the same class, under the tongue, or even nasally. So there's a lot of different ways you can deliver different medications um, if someone's having difficulty, uh, but a lot of them, we don't have all those options available. Um, we do have another audience question. Audience, audience question would be great. Uh, can MS be genetic? My mother had MS, my brother has MS, and I have MS. I'd say yes. Um, there are over 230 genes which have been associated with risk of developing MS. Uh, the majority of them have very, very small impacts. The majority of them increase the risk. Some of them actually decrease the risk of developing MS. The majority of these are related to uh, the immune system. And so not terribly surprising, actually. Um, and so the one that's the most important is the HLA type, the human leukocyte antigen. There's, this is the blood test that gets done when you want to match somebody up for like a kidney transplant. And there is a marker. Um, uh, I always have to remind myself, HLA-BDR1501, I think is what it's called, uh, that increases your risk about threefold of developing MS. That's the biggest one. So about a threefold increased risk, which doesn't account for when you take all 230 of those genes, does not account for the amount of variation we have uh, in terms of what the cause is for MS. So there has to be a lot of other environmental factors. And so we know that Epstein-Barr virus is probably related, smoking is related, obesity is related, there's probably toxic exposures, uh, pollution, and other things that are related. And so there's, there are a lot of other things that are related to risk for developing MS. And interestingly, in uh, the summer, um, was the first paper that ever came out that suggested that there was a specific gene that was associated with severity of MS, not just developing MS, but severity of MS, one. Uh, and then we received a paper at the uh, journal that I edit along with my, my boss, who's really the editor, I'm the, the sub-editor um, called Annals of Neurology. We received a paper this summer after that that suggested um, that they were wrong. Uh, and so when they tried to repeat it in their database, which was in uh, Wales, uh, they, they could not repeat it. Uh, and then when we had you know, various people uh, comment and review the paper, uh, they actually looked at another database um, and uh, they similarly could not find that, but they found a couple other ones with, which might be related to severity uh, with very, very low notes. So, I mean, if it was one time, it'd be the exact same risk with or without the drug. And these were like, 1.2 or 1.1, so barely increasing the risk of, uh, of in this case, having worse uh, MS. So the, the big answer is there are lots of different ways that genes might play a role, but it's not quite the same. Like Huntington's Korea, like uh, Woody Guthrie had, his son Arlo Guthrie did not have. And that's a neurodegenerative disorder that the movement do disorder doctors take care of. They have it's called Huntington's Korea because they have abnormal movements that look like a dance. And uh, it's a fatal disorder, it's a horrible disorder. And um, uh, it is genetic, it is a dominant gene, 50% risk of developing MS. So for, our, for, for us, we're a much lower risk. So if a mom has MS, nobody else in her family has MS, her daughter has about four to 5% chance of developing MS, and her son would have about a one to 2% chance. Uh, however, uh, understanding that risk better uh, is what we would like to do. So we're doing studies right now. In children, we call it dreams. In adults, we call it uh, RISE, risk factors in early MS, where we're looking at uh, families and looking at the asymptomatic individuals who are 10 to 30. That is before the average, the average time someone would develop MS would be 30. We want to get them at the front end, asymptomatic. 
uh, and we're doing a variety of blood tests. We do a screen where we ask them, like, where were you born? Do you smoke? Where do you work? Have you been exposed to various things? We do the genetic testing that I described, um, and we do an MRI scan. And uh, we look to see if they have asymptomatic, so-called radiologic isolated syndrome, asymptomatic lesions in their brain that look like MS. And so uh, this is a longitudinal study. And there are other groups in the country who are doing similar studies, but not exactly the same as ours. And we've been trying to get together to see if we can come up with a common data set that we could then have five times as many uh, patients. But we have about 180 patients so far that we've been following over time. We have about 60 that have gotten a second scan. And we have uh, two that have developed MS. Um, shortly after, well, one was shortly after, I mean, shortly after within a couple of months of their screening, and one was about three years later. Uh, and so we have stored blood and we have all sorts of other things that occurred before uh, they developed MS. And we would hopefully then be able to use that to then say, okay, that risk is not four or 5% for your daughter, that risk is 20%, or conversely, maybe it's less than 1%. And so to come up with an algorithm to help define what that risk is, some of which would be genetic and some of which would be related to environmental issues. Um, Do you have another audience question? Oh, audience question, go for it. <laughs> uh, you spoke about spasticity with nerve pain. Besides gabapentin, what are your go-to pharmaceuticals and non-drugs? Right. Um, so uh, so uh, questions about fun. nerve pain and nerve pain, um, is really a pain, literally and figuratively, um, for a lot of people. Uh, it used to be said a million years ago, oh, if you have pain, it's not from MS, it has to be from something else. Uh, that's totally wrong. Um, and so uh, for neuropathic pain, uh, gabapentin is often used as a first agent for several reasons. One, it's generic. Two, uh, it, uh, it doesn't do any worse from a side effect profile, primarily sedation, but doesn't have a lot of other side effects. That's by far the biggest one except for maybe weight gain, which can be troublesome for some people. Um, uh, the third though, and maybe the biggest one, is it doesn't do, uh, it's not excreted or in any way metabolized by your liver. It's excreted out the kidney. And so it has no drug interactions with any of the other drugs that we use. And that is a big advantage because drug interactions in the liver can be problematic. So uh, that's a real advantage. Disadvantage, uh, you have to take it up two, three, four times a day, typically three times a day. Some people use it only at night because they have neuropathic pain that keeps them awake and they have to put them to sleep and that's okay. But many people have to take it multiple times a day. And I'm sure there's many people in this room that know more about this than I. It's really hard to take a drug at all, but much less the more times you add it, you can see uh, there are many studies that show, uh, adherence studies that show that more times you have to take a medication, the less likely someone is to take it correctly. It's just human nature. It's just hard to take a pill three or four times a day. Um, so gabapentin is one. Uh, these are all borrowed from other conditions. That's an anti-seizure drug. Other anti-seizure drugs. Uh, Tegretol has been used for many, many years, especially for trigeminal neuralgia, the facial pain that's typical of MS. Still the standard of care uh, 60 years later. Um, amitriptyline and nortriptyline, the drugs that are old-fashioned tricyclic antidepressants. Deloxetine, which, uh, which is a new uh, antidepressant relatively, Cymbalta, and it is actually approved for neuropathic pain and depression. Uh, and then also topical things, uh, lidocaine patches I mentioned. Um, uh, you can also use capsation, which is the active ingredient, red hot chili peppers. Uh, you have to be really careful when you use that. You have to wear gloves. Uh, you have to wash your hands uh, scrupulously and keep your hands out of your nose, your mouth, your face, and anywhere else that's a mucous membrane because you can burn yourself. Um, and you have to use that like four or five, six times a day uh, at first. And then after that, much less. You have to, what it does is it depletes the so-called substance P from the nerve terminal. Once you get that down, you can use it much less often. If you have to put your whole body in it, it's kind of a problem. If you have a very focal area, those local topical things can be very good. Like if it's one foot, you can use a lidocaine patch and that might be really good. So there are a lot of different approaches to neuropathic pain, which is important because it's really a disabling kind of symptom. Sure, go ahead. The biggest side effect long-term, which is the question for gabapentin, is uh, weight gain. And not everybody gets it, but if you use it for a long time, it can be an irritation of people. And 
and you know you can't it doesn't seem that you can exercise it away or change your diet away it just seems that people gain weight for reasons we don't understand so on that happy note i'm gonna go eat dinner so i can gain some weight because that was we're out of time so thank you very much for coming uh those are all great questions i appreciate you coming out on a Thursday night to spend your time with us. Uh, you have plenty of other things you can spend your time doing, so we appreciate that. Uh, I just want to echo Dr. Corboys. Thank you for joining us. Um, a reminder, we have posted an evaluation. There's evaluations on the table. We do use those, read them. Um, and then I just wanted to talk about a couple of uh, resources that we have. Um, if you're interested in the topic of research and particularly in participating in research, our next issue of INFORMS is going to be focused on research. Um, we also have some previous issues uh, that have focused on particular studies. Dr. Alvarez did a research updates presentation at the last Ed Summit. Um, Dr. Corboy has provided us with multiple uh, DISCO MS resources. We've got an article we have, um, I think, a couple of articles, a pretty in-depth webinar, um, so you can just search our website for DISCO. Um, and then we have some previous issues of INFORMS, the magazine on fatigue and nutrition um, called Food for Thought. Uh, so I encourage you to check those out as well. Thank you.